Hello and good evening, everyone. My name is Avi Lewis. I'm a filmmaker, a climate activist, and a, a, an associate professor of geography at the University of British Columbia. And I'll be your host for this evening's event. Uh, I'm coming to you today from Huel Kwai, otherwise known as Half Moon Bay, uh, on the traditional territory of the Shisha people uh, in, near Seashell, British Columbia on the Sunshine Coast. Um, and as well as acknowledging the land that, that I'm on for this evening's event, um, I wanna take a moment and acknowledge that uh, we're all living on indigenous land, on, on stolen land. And this conversation tonight rests on a very longstanding tradition of ind indigenous knowledge and traditional ways of knowing uh, about the connection between the water, the air, the land, what we put in our bodies and our human society. And we'll explore that as the uh, as the conversation mm -hmm. unfolds. This is one of the first events in a recently launched international impact campaign connected to the documentary Into the Weeds, which just premiered on CBC's Passionate Eye and is now streaming on CBC Gem. So departing from the script off the top here, it is a thrilling, revelatory film, uh, an, an, an un, not, unstoppable uh, uh, experience, which I strongly encourage you, if you haven't seen the film already, uh, to dive into at the soonest possible opportunity and let this conversation tonight be a, be a, uh, an appetizer for that. The campaign connected to, to the film, the Impact Campaign, aims to use the power of documentary film to move ourselves uh, collectively and confidently towards a future without glyphosate and pesticides. So everything you need to know about the campaign, you can find at the campaign website, intotheweedsimpact.com. The website link is pinned to the top of the Facebook comments, so you can find it anytime. We've got about an hour tonight. We're gonna have an informal conversation with six folks who all have deep connections in their life and work to the issue of glyphosate use. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring them on one at a time to, to do a quick uh, interview first, uh, starting with the filmmaker, Jennifer Beishwal, and, uh, and then, we'll have a, uh, then we'll have a round table and I hope an informal and, and, uh, and spirited conversation uh, among all of us. If we have time and we've got a packed agenda, I also wanna play a couple of clips from the film. Uh, we'll take a couple of questions, audience questions from the comments section of the Facebook Live. So feel free to add your questions in the comments without you know, expectation that every question will be answered and we will do our best. Uh, if you're unable to comment on Facebook, please feel free to email any questions you have to info at intotheweedsimpact.com. So let's start with a clip from the film and then I'll bring on Jennifer and, uh, and, and, and we'll get into the subject, uh, which is a future without glyphosate, uh, whether it's possible, how to achieve it, and that's what we're gonna to discuss tonight. But let's start with a clip from Into the Weeds, directed by Jennifer Beishwal. Now glyphosate, this is the chemical equation. Um, for those of you who can read chemical equations, um, it was actually originally discovered in the 1960s and it wasn't discovered as an herbicide or a weed killer. It was patented originally as a stripper for industrial boilers. Uh, then he discovered actually, hey, <laughs> sink kills weeds. Clean field means that the only plant alive is the one you want. But the curse of the land is the weeds. Most farmers now, you look more like a spaceman than you do a farmer when you're loading the machines. And be loading these machines every 90 minutes for a week or two weeks. And then you're doing it again in the summertime, and then you're doing it again in the fall to bring in your harvest. 
being on the front line of, of using this product, farmers are exposed to it the most for the longest period of time. I've been spraying for 50 years, my God. This is where I am, right here. Okay, that's, that's where I live. Everything north of here, all of this here is spray. One time or another. A clip from Into the Weeds, uh, uh, a new documentary which has just premiered on The Passionate Eye and is available to stream on CBC Gem, directed by Jennifer Bashwell. Jennifer has been directing and producing documentaries for 25 years, among other films, installations, and lens-based projects. She's made 10 feature documentaries which have played all over the world and won many awards nationally and internationally. This film, Into the Weeds, follows former groundskeeper Lee Johnson and his fight for justice against the agrochemical giant Monsanto. Jennifer, it's so great to talk to you about this film. I just really was so moved and rocked by it. And it's a courtroom thriller that had me glued uh, to the screen. So congrats and thank you for doing this. You've made a lot of films about big ideas over the last couple of decades. Um, and now you've made a film about a pesticide. Why did you make a film about glyphosate? What is it? What is the significance of, of this chemical? I think the clip gave a sense of just how much of it is used, um, but why? What is, what's the big deal? Well, I mean, thank you for that lovely introduction. And it's so nice to see your face, Avi. Um, basically, glyphosate is the world's most widely used herbicide. And because of that, as you saw in that clip, and I really wanted to show just how ubiquitous it is, um, you know, every playground, golf course, whatever, middle of the of the road, highways, <clears throat> rail, rail lines, hydro lines, etc. And, and it so I think a lot of people think of it as just being used in agriculture, or people mm -hmm. spray little weeds in their garden, I still don't know What's the difference between a weed and a plant? But we can get into that later. Um, but, uh, but basically, um, it's used everywhere, and the you know being used in forestry, for example, where it is sprayed aerially to to protect the conifers from the broadleaf species that compete for light and space and nutrients. And because of that, it it, it is literally soaked into us. It's soaked into our, our planet. It's soaked into our bodies. There is a stat that says, um, of a study out of America that says 80% of people have traces of glyphosate in their urine. And so it's, it's like it's in, it's in, it's probably in everyone or most people us. watching this yeah. right now. It's, 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 like it's in the, us. The FOAs, it's one of those things that we're living with all the time. And when friends of ours were sort of starting this trial, basically, and I said, well, is somebody documenting it? And they said, no. And I just thought, oh, my God, like Monsanto is a very complex company that has a very complex history. But I felt the most important thing was to create an historical record of this moment 
where an ordinary person tries to go up against a giant multinational and let's see what happens. And then it telescopes out to the bigger picture of ubiquity of use mm -hmm. and systemic effects. That's why. That that's that's um, that really is um, the experience one gets watching the film. Uh, now it's worth noting right off the top that uh, Bayer, the pharmaceutical giant, which now uh, owns Monsanto, as well as all international regulatory agencies, maintain that glyphosate-based herbicides are safe for use as directed. And yet, it, it, it there does seem to be a tremendous amount of activism around glyphosate. There seems to be it seems to be percolating to the surface of the public conversation. Just over on the other side of the mountains, behind where I live, is the Akatslim How Sound, and in Squamish and North, there's a vast area of tree plantations and forest which is regularly sprayed, sprayed which is given birth to a new movement, a stop the spray movement, a very powerful ground-based social movement. So how do you, what do you sense is changing in the global conversation about glyphosate right now? Locate us in the historic moment. Okay, so the, what, what is interesting is that these trials, so the first three trials, Lee's was the bellwether trial. It was the one that was going to determine how, basically how all the rest would go. In, in the States, mass torts, multi-district le legislation is, is, is a sort of different um, litigation, multi-district litigation is a different model than class action suits, is what, which is what we do in Canada. And because these trials, there's now been, there's, you know, thousands of plaintiffs, over 100,000 plaintiffs that are either waiting for their day in court or getting settlements. And it has put Bayer it under a spotlight, but particularly with their shareholders. I can't, people who, oh, sorry, who, you just froze there for, Bayer, me for like, a second. Why, why is this happening? They, oh, they've paid out so much um, uh, money in, into these lawsuits. So it has put a scrutiny back onto glyphosate. And what's interesting is that mm -hmm. we're at an inflection point with um, a lot of regulatory reviews that were, I think, engendered by these trials. And that's why we've started this impact campaign to try to, you know, shine a light on, 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 on the trial and on the scientific studies that show that glyphosate um, or that uh, allegedly show that glyphosate is uh, is dangerous and to influence that policy review. The the Monsanto papers, um, I take it, are, are is the way that it's common, like the, the documents that were uh, produced in discovery in these in these action in these suits in the in the states. And it like there were Paradise Papers and other papers and great leaks of documents when we live in that age, you know, and I, I kind of noticed it go by, but I wasn't really focused on it. But I know you took a deep dive into the Monsanto Papers, as did the film. And I just want to ask you before I start broadening out this conversation to others, what was the most shocking thing that you learned in the course of making this film? And I, not as much as the lawyers, but I know you must have poured through thousands of documents with you and your great research team in making the film. We had an incredible research team. And yes, let's get away from me and start talking to our amazing um, <laughs> panelists here. But I will just say the paper, the process of discovery, of course, you know, involves often thousands, hundreds of thousands of documents. In this case, there were millions of documents. And in the old days, it would have been two teams of lawyers in an airplane hangar with bankers boxes going through files. Now all of it is fed into computers and it's actually artificial intelligence that helps find um, what what they you know the lawyers need in order to make their case and I suppose the most shocking thing to me was this I can't you know there's evidence in these papers of real corporate malfeasance ghostwriting of of papers that are meant to be independent scientific papers um uh sort of maligning independent scientists that are going against um uh the uh, what what the corporate line is on glyphosate safety um a, an attempt to discredit and to attack IARC the International Association for Research on Cancer but one of the things that I kept coming across when I was looking through the papers was we you know we've got to protect our FTO 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 and I thought what the hell is that freedom to operate it's it's all about doing as much as you can until somebody stops you and um and and that that was a shock for me that felt like a kind of cognitive dissonance um of the people who work there and you know go home to their families and have dinner and go to ball games and then go back to work and uh engage in that kind of malfeasance but that freedom to operate is is like the social license 
it's the because it, a lot of what you're saying reminds me of big tobacco, of big oil and gas, of the kind of publicity approaches when you know that the product you sell is harmful. We have to keep saying allegedly harmful um, because these uh, companies are litigious. Um, but there's yeah, there's a pattern here. Let's unfold. Let's start unfolding this the the many dimensions of glyphosate in our society. I want to bring on Brett Israel. Uh, Brett is uh, Brett Israel Farms. Brett's a farmer uh, in Wellington County. is a partner in Three Gen Organics, a multi generational organic family farm. So along with his parents and grandparents, Brett farms twelve hundred acres of certified organic cropland, raises organic pigs, some of which are very cute. Uh, Brett is committed to biological agriculture and building local food networks to improve the health of humans, the soil, and the planet as a whole. Welcome, Brett. Well, hello, everyone. There we go. Yeah. Let me. Well, I just want to ask you the, the 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 primary question, which underlies all of the guests in this conversation. What is your relationship to glyphosate? This is an incredibly widely used chemical in agriculture. You're a third generation farmer. What's your relationship with this pesticide? Well, it's a great question, Avi. Um, our, our family farm operation, we were farming before glyphosate was even a thing. So if you go back to my grandparents and even great grandparents, they had to farm without it. And then as the operation evolved through the decades into the 1970s and 80s and 90s, my grandfather used it as many conventional farmers did. Um, and then when my parents and I came back into the farming operation full time, we knew we wanted to to farm without a dependence on these synthetic inputs. So we stopped using glyphosate on our farm back in 2015 and have managed our land as an organic operation free from any glyphosate since then. And what's been pretty cool is we've actually been able to expand our operation in the process. So it, it hasn't contracted us. It's allowed us to actually grow and, uh, and achieve, you know, more food production in the process. Is it, what was your experience like watching the film and watching those guys put on spacesuits and try to protect themselves from one of the critical pieces of, of modern agriculture? Well, you know, watching the film uh, was definitely very moving, but we see it in our backyard every day. You know, we're surrounded by conventional operations. Uh, this summer, I went actually to a, a field night hosted by one of the local spraying companies. And I think one of the big things to remember, and, and the film did a great job portraying it, is that the individual farmer you know, they're a partner in this process. In, in a lot of ways, they've become uh, made to feel that they need to use these products because of a, of a razor thin margin in the food production space. And I think if we yeah. can zone out, and look at the overall environmental impacts, the human health impacts, the ecological impacts, we could provide farmers with a better future that isn't dependent on what's being pushed their way. Uh, we stop using glyphosate. I never see, I, I don't see a future for our farm using that product um, it becomes almost a feudal system where most of the margin is going to the agrochemical businesses and not actually staying on the farm so the farmer's suffering the, the, the planet's suffering and uh, the people that are eating our food are suffering it, it's really a, a lot of folks are suffering and a lot of money is going to the hands of very few which is a concerning state for for wanting a vibrant rural landscape Amazing. Uh, I can I, I can tell you've thought about this a lot. And I, um, yeah, I appreciate a bigger picture of the farming system. Stay, stay with us, Brett. I, I want to keep bringing in guest after guest here until we're until we're all in the in the uh, in the zoom boxes. Uh, let me introduce now Gabriel Aladois. Uh, Gabriel is a former fi migrant farm worker from St. Lucia who's now an organizer with a fabulous collective called Justice for Migrant Workers that I've been a fan of for many, many years. Gabriel's a member of the Black Creek Community Farm Steering Committee and the Black Creek, Black Creek Community Farm is an incredible food sovereignty uh, center, uh, which connects issues of racial justice and, and food justice and economic justice. Um, and uh, Gabriel is a person who, who is fighting for a Canadian food system that is healthy, sustainable, and just. And you'll hear him say that again. Uh, Gabriel, you came as a, as a migrant farm worker, a group of workers upon which our food system in Canada rests. And I think we saw during the pandemic, a lot of really shocking cases of how the lack of basic human rights and labor rights for migrant farm workers affected the most essential workers in society uh, in, the, in this time. But let's, let's stay with glyphosate and with pesticide use. How, what is the migrant farm worker experience with glyphosate is in, in your experience, what, what, what you've seen on farms. 
extra special greetings to each and everyone um, within our work and hairs tonight. I want to say that being a migrant farm worker in Canada, you don't have the same rights as a Canadian. Um, during the pandemic, when employment was so high in Canada, I taught Canadians to go to the farm and produce their own food. Even when employment is so high, Canadians still do not want to produce the food. Why is that? I don't know. The conditions are not right. Um, P, 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 migrant workers do the planting the picking, the, pro the processing, the packaging, even in the restaurants, we prepare your meals for you. So we're in the front line. I'm telling you, being a migrant farm worker, we're in the front line of chemicals. If we in the front line are not safe, guess what? You the consumer, are you any safer? Let me tell you some of the basic things that I experienced. As a migrant farm worker, I was maybe like 20 meters away from spraying, from the, 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 the um, pesticides being sprayed, 20 meters or even less. That's one. Number two, um, after pesticides have been sprayed, we are not much time is given before we are allowed to enter that area. Number three, during this year, maybe, maybe last month, August, August, July, August, I received reports of migrant workers collapsing in the field because that were recently sprayed. Number four, I get reports as a, a now that I'm an activist, I get reports of how workers are being exposed to pesticides, even even the open fields, the drift of the pesticides. Now, um, the real thing for me, and and that's the that's the amazing thing with pesticides. You do not see all the effects right away. You do not see the effects right away. The long term effects of pesticides. I wish somebody would carry out those studies on migrant workers. Because because we're exposed to those things. I, I wish somebody would carry out those effects and see like cancer and the study of cancer and, and those other illnesses that migrant workers will develop down the line. That is the problem with pesticides. We do not see the full effects right away. I, 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 wanna, I wanna stay with the question of migrant workers and this is less about pesticides, but um, because, because I think it's critical for the, for the voice and the reality of the least protected folks in the entire food system to be brought to bear. I've read many reports of migrant farm workers who get sick and then they just get deported. Um, and access to the healthcare system uh, is critical if you're talking about being uh, exposed to chemicals that could have health impacts. What is, what is it like to be a farm worker and to get sick or to get a rash or to get a reaction and not know whether it was glyphosate or whatever else you might be working with. And, and then, you know, your family's relying on that income that you're sending back. What's it like from a human point of view? Okay, uh, um, two things. Number one, the three pillars of the program. One, we are here in Canada to do jobs Canadians do not want to do. And what are the jobs Canadians do not want to do? Non-unionized work, right? The D jobs, the dirty jobs, the difficult, dangerous. Number two, we are tied to our employer. We have a tied work permit. And number three, we cannot apply for status. Let me go over that. To be tied to your employer, to do the dirty work, non-unionized work, and at the same time, not having status means you're denied basic human rights, you're denied basic labor standards. That's what the program is. Now we come here as a well oil machine, well oil machine. We, we have to do health check and so on before we come to Canada. The moment you get injured, we're here to do those dangerous jobs. And every year workers are dying. Every year, migrant workers are there. That tells you how dangerous the work is. Just recently, maybe two, three weeks ago, at least four workers died in one week, in the space of one week. So far, at least 10 workers have died. Every year, workers are dying. That tells you how dangerous um, you know, the working conditions are. Many more get injured, many more get injured, and, and it's another fight with WSIB. And the other amazing thing is our employees control the travel agency that books our flight in and out of Canada. When we get injured, it's so easy to send us back home and, and get a replacement. We are disposable labor. And as you said, we are very vulnerable simply because we do not have status. And that is a recipe to exploit us, to exploit us, to keep us submissive and compliant. I, I wanted to depart from the, the issue in front of us of glyphosate because it's so important to see how the industrial inputs in the food system reach out into every part of our life and society. And so now I want to uh, let's go to the to the core, to the to the to the um, to the underlay of, of our settler colonial state of Canada and bring in an indigenous perspective. Susan Bell Chiblo is an assistant professor uh, at the University of Guelph School of Environmental Sciences. Sue is, uh, is Anishinaabe Kwe born and raised in Garden River First Nation in Ontario. She's worked extensively with First Nation communities for the last 30 years in environmentally related fields. Sue has a BSc in biology, an MSc in environment and management, and a PhD in environmental science 
with a focus on Nabi Kim Daswan, uh, water knowledge. Sue, welcome. Um, and I would love it if you could take us into how you see glyphosate uh, from, from the perspective of, 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 a, of an indigenous worldview. All right, <clears throat> thank you. Um, first, I need bonjour to Chibro Dishnikaz, Ogama Anug Indigo, to Jack Dodam, Tetaganzi Bing Dunjaba, Tetaganzi Bing Indogam. So, um, I have been fortunate enough to work with elders over the last 30 years. And more recently, well, maybe in the last 20 years, working with elders from the North Shore, North Shore area, which then grew into the Robinson Huron Treaty Territory. And their primary concern, the reason why they came together <clears throat> is because of the aerial spraying that's happening in our territories with glyphosate. And when they talk about what's happening to the lands, they talk about how it's happening to us. And a few speakers already mentioned this. We are directly linked to the land. We are the land and what we do to the lands, we do to ourselves. This glyphosate, actually according to a lot of the studies and there needs to be a lot more studies done, but the traditional knowledge that the elders hold in this territory are saying that this is actually killing biodiversity. It's killing the species, it's killing our foods. And if it's killing our foods and biodiversity, it's actually killing our way of life. It's killing our language. It's affecting everything on who we are. And what they say is that this is just another form of a colonial attack on Indigenous peoples. Because when we look at Ontario's biodiversity strategy, it doesn't seem to go any farther than the Muskokas or Perry Sound. It's like nobody else exists in the North and especially the indigenous peoples. So this is another form of colonialism attacking us as indigenous peoples. What do you see on your lands? Um, what are they doing spraying glyphosate from the air? So they do what they call selection cut. But if you've ever been into a selection cut, that's maybe five trees left alone standing in miles by themselves. And it looks this is very, like, very, this is forestry cool. practices we're talking about, hey? Yes, and this is, and those trees look so lonely and sad. And once they've done that, what they do is they come in and they spray the glyphosate because they want to attract the broad, broad leaf plants and they want the evergreens to grow. Um, and so when, when they do that, they come in and they, they are making plantations. And when you walk into one of these areas, once these trees start to grow, it's dead silence. You can't even hear a mosquito, um, a bird, nothing. And, and it's absolutely dead. And this, you know, in, in some areas, all you see for miles is black because everything has died. It's, it's just a huge, huge graveyard of what we as Indigenous peoples, specifically Anishinaabek peoples, those are our relatives. You know, the lands are our pharmacy, it's our education system, it's our kitchen, it's our everything. We wouldn't go into somebody else's kitchen and poison them. And this is how we look at it. You know, we wouldn't walk into an education system and poison everything. We, we're, we're, being, we're being attacked. A powerful perspective. Um, let's let's go into the area of human health um and we've all talked about the the impacts uh of the system on human health i want to introduce you to dr raquel ferro who's a member of the canadian association of physicians for the environment cape one of our great activist medical groups um raquel who also goes by rocky uh practiced as an internal medicine specialist and towards the end of her career worked in chronic pain and complex illness and retirement has allowed her to volunteer for groups which contribute to planetary health like CAPE. Uh, and Rocky has pushed for most recently a ban on cosmetic pesticides in the city of Edmonton. So Rocky, as a retired physician and as our, as our medical person here on this panel, um, can you tell me how and what you learned about the science that regulatory agencies rely on when they're making decisions about pesticides? Because you know, what we've heard and what we've seen is scary, and yet it all takes place under the law. And we have these public bodies that are supposed to, you know, protect us. So what, what, is, the, what is the system that is, that, is, that is meant to protect our health, and what's your take on it? My good news, bad news story, bad news first. Uh, 
over the past 15 years that I've been interested in pesticide reduction and understanding the system, I've been repeatedly exposed to the ways that the vested interests manipulate the science. And I, that's why I loved watching Into the Weeds. It does such a great job of exposing the manipulated science. And sadly, the pesticide regulators act more as collaborators than they do as watchdogs. And I don't think people are really aware of that. Um, they're, they're not watchdogs of the multinational agrochemical industry. And the regulators rely heavily on, um, I guess we're supposed to say alleged science um, since they're litigious and um, not to be too cheeky, but the, the, they rely on the science provided by industry and that science, alleged science can be very opaque and very self-serving. And I, I just wanna leave it at that because I wanna mm -hmm. just focus on the good news. And that is, as we saw in the film that the law firm that represented Lee Johnson so well relied on the sound science uh, the, uh, that was systematically assembled by the International Agency for Research on Cancer that Jennifer talks about. And, and the international agency is independent. They screen for conflicts of interest and uh, doing so is the hallmark of their program. They're fully transparent. And if you when if you read the monograph of the working group that classified glyphosate as a probable carcinogen, there's like a 40 page preamble that really outlines the, the rigor with which in they work. Um, it was a year long review led by independent experts without conflict of interest. They allow industry at the table, but not to as guests so they can have input yeah, they, can they don't they don't they don't set the table they, they don't, don't build the table yeah exactly so in some summary um the regulator science is opaque with conflicts of interest and the international association for research on cancer as you'll see in the wonderful movie if you watch it is evidence-based transparent and very rigorous and I really think that's important for people to realize because industry in, in every setting I've been in at City Hall often repeats the lie that the regulators are the ultimate health authority. So they try to make the decision makers feel very insecure about the science. But um, everyone on the call tonight should learn to call that out and counter that assertion because physicians and the medical community and those that want to hang on to their licensing realize that regulators are not the authorities, but sound expert agencies like the International Association for Research on Cancer are. That's amazing. So, so uh, like what I'm what I'm hearing from you is like a landscape of captured regulators uh, across countries and jurisdictions, and there's this one body which i think is it's it's a it's a it's an organ of the world health organization uh iarc which figures heavily in the film the one major international uh medical body that has found a link between glyphosate and cancer that it, there's a probable link there right and then and, and what did this what what is the what's the significance of iarc's finding like what is it what is what has happened since that finding was was made well, hold on. That, Jen, jump in. Go ahead. Thing, but I just have to jump in to say that the 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 attacks on IARC that happened from Monsanto before their decision was even reached was okay. extraordinary in its force and it's it was. Uh, I mean, I, I think we're talking about their public affairs budget for that year was seventeen million dollars, and a lot of it was targeted against trying to discredit IARC and and. And, and that's the kind of thing that we're up against when we are dealing with these multinationals. And back to the capture thing, it's also a revolving door so that the people who are at the top of industry, yeah. they go <clears throat> to, to the regulators for a while, then they go back to industry. And it just seems like such a massive, conf an obvious conflict of interest. But um, the, the repercussions of that, I want Rocky to speak to that because that, that 2015 ruling changed a lot and then engendered this huge war. Was that a turning point, Rocky, in the in the in the medical debate around this chemical? Uh, uh, 
let me not be wishy-washy. I, I think that it, it is, if we use the good work of the people here tonight, if we use the good work of this movie to really counter the narrative because of, um, of Health Canada and Pesticide Management Regulatory Agency being the ultimate authority because industry has a lot of money and they're very good at marketing. They're very good at working through their umbrella groups like crop life to get lawn care companies and astroturf campaigns to keep repeating the lie that the regulators are an authority, um, not just a collaborator of, of big ag. So I think um, it can be a turning point. I feel hopeful it will be a turning point, but we need to be really clear about the science and, and where the rigor lies. And that is with the International Association for Research on Cancer. And, and I wouldn't characterize them as one group because it's one group with mm -hmm. many, many signatories. So it's a large umbrella of people dedicated to the public interest and to rigor in science. This is great. Well, I think we're really getting a sense of the landscape. And I think what we've heard so far from all of these different uh, perspectives kind of leaves us at the doorstep of, of action, of activism, and of this rising uh, and connected series of campaigns and movements who are trying to change this situation. And, and that's why I want to bring in Mary Lou McDonald, who is uh, a lawyer and uh, founder and president of Safe Food Matters. Mary Lou um, was one of the founders of Safe Food Matters, and Safe Food Matters is the group that took Health Canada to court in 2017 over its re-registration, its reauthorization of glyphosate, and in February uh, just this year, 2022, won the case. So this is a milestone in the Canadian regulatory environment. Uh, so as a result, the Pesticide Management Regulatory Agency, PMRA, I think I got that right, has to revisit uh, what's called the glyphosate notice of objection written by Mary Lou. So Mary Lou's a lawyer with like 27 years experience. She's worked as a private practice as a lawyer in-house for major renewable energy companies and a chemical company. So not a, not a, not a dyed in the wool greenie, although well, you know, kind of playing that role these days. Mary Lou, I, I, I'm, this is where our conversation has brought us. Um, the, and you're at the forefront of the fight against glyphosate in Canada. So tell us a, about the action that you've taken so far and what, what you think this fall might bring uh, in the struggle that you've been pursuing for, for more than five years now. Thanks, Avi. Um, I, I'd like to, first of all, thank, thanks, thank you for being here. Um, it's been exciting uh, and everything is coming together like a perfect storm this autumn. It's fantastic. Uh, what we did in 2017 when uh, the re-registration decision of PMRA came out was we wrote notices of objection, which was allowed in the law, on basically four fronts, um, which we can get into. But the first was that um, when you spray glyphosate on crops, particularly legumes, it moves right into the seed and there's high levels in that, in, in the seed, and we're eating that. And I didn't know that. So I said, hey, regulator, you guys might want to take a look at that, which is what the point of the, uh, of the, the, provision of the statute was. Um, and then secondly, I noticed that the dietary exposure numbers that they were looking at were actually, um, they were looking at what Americans were eating in the mid 1990s, instead of what Canadians were eating in 2017. I was like, well, wait a minute, how can you make sure you're protecting us when we're off decade and off population? Um, and then thirdly, I noticed that they, uh, um, reduce the safety factor that the law requires for children because we care about our kids, which is a tenfold safety factor um, in terms of protecting them uh, when it comes to thresholds. And it's not supposed to be reduced unless you have good scientific rationale for doing so. And they just came up with a bogus con contextual explanation and reduced it down. Um, and, uh, and then fourthly, we basically said, hey guys, the labels aren't working. Did you check as to whether the labels are working? Um, you say to spray at a certain moisture content of the bean, uh, but that's not going to work because there are some beans that are always going to have high moisture content. They're called indeterminate. They keep growing all the time. Um, and also you're looking at moisture content when really it's about the level of maturity of the plant. So we need some expert scientists to help us out with this. Uh, they said, thanks for coming out, get lost. We sued. They said, thanks for coming out, get lost. 
So then we um, uh, actually won in the Federal Court of Appeal, as you said. And what was great was the Court of Appeal, this is the first time they'd had to deal with the PMRA, and they kind of said, here's some guidance for you when you look at this again. When you answer Safe Food Matters again, make sure that you respond with an answer that says, this is how it accords with the, the purpose of the act, which is to protect human health and the environment from the risks of pesticide. So we're expecting that answer um, uh, this autumn. Safe Food Matters has also uh, Go ahead. Uh, been involved with um, the proposal to increase the levels of glyphosate in our food called maximum residue limits or MRLs. And that came around last summer uh, and Canadians didn't like it at all. There was an election on and the, the proposal was paused. But we were lucky enough to, well, I requested it in July, I think, and got the confidential test data that underlied that, that proposal. And we found out some interesting things. Um, one of which is that, uh, uh, well, I think it was known in the press that basically Monsanto asked for this increase. Uh, and, uh, and when you dig down, it looks like um, that the, uh, the, the level setting for the MRLs came from a group called the Joint Meeting on Pesticide Revenue, uh, Revenues, Residues, which uh, is about revenue, <laughs> which occurred right. in 2019 in Gatineau, uh, Quebec. And basically that's a consortium of uh, non-regulatory people um, that decide this is what we want the maximum residue level to be because we want higher levels so that we can trade across the world at these harmonized trade levels of high acceptable uh, glyphosate residues in food. So that if you have, for example, India rejecting lentils um, from Canada because India's MRL is too low uh, and catches our high um, residue levels, then that problem's gonna go away. Um, and then when I looked at the so actual attendance at the JMPR meeting, there were uh, seven Health Canada people and 68 crop life attendants. So we know we know where um, our levels are coming from. Um, so that's so so that so also, just so in the state of in the state of play. So I just want to clear clarify from from a from a layperson's perspective. In the state of play, we have we've caught them out on on you've caught them out on some things, uh, and on the flip side, they want to raise the amount of glyphosate that is uh, allowable in in the food system, in in the in in specific food products, with the excuse of international trade. Uh, but they want to raise the permissible level. Well, so that seems PMRA, like a pretty big fight that's going on right PMRA now. PMRA does, the regulator does, but our politicians kind of put a pause on it because it was election time. Mm -hmm. They said, this, this raising of the MRL levels is on hold. We're going to transform the PMRA. We're going to give them $45 million. We're going to have all these consultations, which are still going on. So the what we heard report from the transformation agenda is due in the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned for what they say there. If they just say, oh, we heard industry and we didn't hear what, what Canadians are saying or the NGOs are saying, we'll know what's going on again. Um, so this fight is really, is really live. That's can great. I yeah, Jen, go ahead. For, can I jump in for a sec just to say, Mary Lou, and, yeah. and Brett, maybe you can talk about this, sorry, I just can't help being a director in the sense of like, I want to talk about desiccation because it's also something that just like people, a lot of people don't know that, you know, um, glyphosate is bombarded onto forests, as Sue told us about. And and that person that you saw in, in the clip is Ray Owl, who is one of the traditional ecological knowledge elders that Sue works with. Um, and and uh, but I, I, I want somebody to explain and maybe you can do it, Brett, desiccation, because when I learned about that, I was like flummoxed um, because it, 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 it represents a whole new level of, of exposure for humans. Yeah, let's do it. Let's well, have, a, let's have a, a, a quick seminar on desiccation. For sure. <laughs> so I, I think out, right? <laughs> drying things down. Yeah. It's definitely one of those topics that most people are totally ignorant towards. And I think once the general public is aware of it, they say, wow, major red flag. Basically it's a practice uh, for certain crop types where conventional farmers will spray Roundup uh, glyphosate mixed with other products to increase um, its, uh, its effectiveness and in drying plants down. And they do so prior to harvest in order to increase the efficiency of harvest, uh, to, produce, to prevent um, weeds that have escaped the herbicide or herbicide resistant weeds, which is a major problem. 
um, from staining crops. And so, uh, you know, this practice is being done now across most soybean acres uh, in North America. Uh, it's being done across wheat acres, barley acres, the, the, the whole range of pulses, um, canola. It's a major issue. I think pretty well the only crop that there isn't a pre-harvest desiccation in our area would be grain corn. Um, so, you know, most conventional farmers in our area, before they hit the field with the combine harvester, the sprayers out there spraying right onto the crop before the harvester comes in to uh, reap what was sown. And uh, it makes us shake our heads because we don't see it being a necessity. And I think when the general public is aware of it, it does raise those major red flags. Well, because so, it's being sprayed so directly on food um, is, 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 right? the, is yeah. the deal. It's drying out the food and it's being sprayed directly on food before harvest. And, and I, I just want to say quickly about the, you know, learning about law. Every film is like a little mini PhD, but the, the, when I learned about the, the level to which research has to um, attain in order to be uh, introduced into court, um, it's called Daubert, the level of Daubert. And if you're below Daubert, you can't introduce that evidence. And one of the things that the lawyers really wanted to talk about is that there has been a lot of new research in the into the gut microbiome and into into you know what what microbiota do for us, all those little crawly things that are all over us and in us. Um, and and the the there was a, a, a parallel between the spike, in gluten intolerance and celiac disease in people and other, you know, bowel related issues like um, at the same time that it that glyphosate was being sprayed directly as a desiccant on food. And, 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 and so I think that that is something that absolutely warrants more research. And if, if I can say so, um, I know the risk assessment of PMRA on glyphosate pretty well, and they assumed that it doesn't, uh, that glyphosate doesn't affect the microbiome at all. Full stop, not looking at it. So that should blow up the whole glyphosate file on its own. Let's, let's, uh, let's move outward to the question of biodiversity. And, and Sue, I, I would love to get your perspective on this as an environmental scientist. So a couple of years ago, the Environmental Protection Agency in the States released this draft biological evaluation that found that glyphosate is likely to kill or injure 93% of plants and animals protected under the Endangered Species Act. And it also found that glyphosate adversely modifies critical habitat for 96% of all species for which critical habitat has been designated. So now we're talking about the non-human world um, and the question of biodiversity. Sue, how do you see the relationship between glyphosate and biodiversity? Well, I think you 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 made a really good point. When the the um, our traditional knowledge talks about how this glyphosate and normally we put humans out of the system, we put us out and above the land um, where we're looking in controlling. But indigenous peoples, we look at the lens from being within the land and looking out. And so, what happens to us when we're um, eating all of this glyphosate is the same thing that's happening to the animals, to the plants, to the birds, to all of these other species. And we've talked, you know, there's been a huge moose decline in uh, population and there's been very little studies done on it. And we've asked before, why are the moose declining? And when you ask a lot of the old people, they're saying it's because of what they're eating. It's getting in, it's attacking their reproductive system, and they're not having as many babies or and or they're not having twins and triplets like they used to. Now you very rarely do you see a triplet set of calves from a moose and you very, very you know, once in a while you'll see um, twins. So the, these types of things that we're looking at are also attacking the foods that we eat and causing all of this biodiversity. And when we look at it, um, you know, we look at it from an ecosystem approach, everything is interconnected and interrelated. Um, the scientists have caught up with us again, and I'll say that in a, in a sarcastic <laughs> kind of manner, because we've always said that the trees are connected to one another. You can't have a monoculture. They need one another. The birch tree needs the pine tree. You don't see when you look into the forest and when you're standing in there, you don't hear a birch tree telling a pine tree to get out of the, out of the forest, or you don't hear a crow telling, um, you know, a, a blue jay to get out of the forest. They work within a system and they work together. And this biodiversity strategy, and of course it is only a strategy, 
Um, you know, it's, it's filled with beautiful words and nice fluff. But when we come down to the reality of it, it's, it's just not happening at all. And I think we all know the underpinnings that forestry is driven by the economy. Um, you know, we talk about pulling there. Now when you see forestry trucks coming out, they're taking out toothpicks, but understanding that it's all about volume. So they're taking out more younger trees every time they take out some of these the, some of these species. So um, this whole biodiversity strategy, uh, we, we need everything to live. And if we really think about it, if there was no humans on this planet, the planet would survive just very well. But if we were to take out the water or if we were to take out the trees, we as humans would be the first one to, to perish. So I think, I think it's a whole paradigm shift in the way we look at how we're actually going to study or um, fight this glyphosate use in our territories. I, Gabriel, I'd love you to jump back in on this because I, I, I hear echoes in the way that Sue talks about the mindset of industrialization that wants one product, one thing in, in great, great quantity and wants to eliminate, wants to kill, destroy everything else other than the, the profitable commodity. And I think that that's that to me, that sounds a lot like the way you've talked about the whole food system. Yes. Thank you again. Um, in Canada, food is not a basic human right. In Canada, food is a commodity. Profit, profit, profit. In Canada, it is legal to exploit the soil, to exploit the environment, to exploit workers. And that is what we're saying, that everything, everything else but the crop. The money comes first, the profit comes first. And that is what we see. So the, the, the health of workers is not important. The health of the soil is not important. The health of the environment is not important. What is important is the crop, the money, the money. And that is why, that is why the, the, um, we are fighting for a Canadian food system that is healthy, that is sustainable, and that is just. Because our future depends on it. And as, as Susan just said, take out the plants, take out what is, what is, what is in the ecosystem. And, and we have lots of evidence. What is our ecosystem without bees and insects? And it is very loud and clear in Ontario that the population of these insects have been really, 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 uh, it is very clear in Ontario. So where are we heading? Where are we heading if we do not take drastic measures? And that is why I'm really happy to be here tonight because there's power in our hands as consumers, as voters, and uh, you know, there's power in our hands and raising the awareness. I'm so grateful for this wonderful opportunity because you as a consumer, you as a voter, you have power to, to create the shift and that is what we want, right? Thank you. Brett, Ravi, can Brett, you talk I feel about like- the petition? Yeah. Can you, <laughs> can you talk you, about the Should we get right to it? Yeah, let's get right to it. You, you go. Um, you know, let's let's please everybody who is listening to this. If you agree, please sign it and send it to all of your friends and your family and get them to sign it too. Because if we have enough signatures, we've we've already reached over a thousand, and we only um, launched it on Friday. Is that right? Was it Friday? So tell us, tell tell, tell, it, tell it like a story, director. What is the petition? <laughs> well, what is it intended to do? Where so, is it at? Okay, so we and we we have these amazing partners, um, and 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 all of our the partners that we're working with on this impact campaign, um, in Canada and now internationally. But you know, Friends of the Earth, Environmental Defense, Eco Justice, Safe Food Matters, Prevent Cancer Now, Cape. Um, who am I missing? Who am I forgetting about? I'll, I'll, I'll get it from one of the brilliant uh, okay. support uh, folks in the chat. And uh, anyway, it sounded like a good list, a very impressive list of organizations. Foundation, David Suzuki Foundation, we all came together to sort of say, look, how can we use this film in a way that actually can 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 reach these inflection points and 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 influence policy change? And so what we learned is that we we have to we have to have something that that, that, that gets the attention of the government. So the peti petition was developed. We did a, we, 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 we carefully worded it and it's very much like, whereas glyphosate does this, 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 and this. And, and basically, um, you know, we, we're, we're, we're asking for a complete ban in Canada. And we're asking for, in addition to that, a much more rigorous, um, uh, approach to the way that we regulate pesticides in this country. And I will so say- So to reduce the use of pesticides. So it's, it's a two-pronged thing. It's, 
ban glyphosate and and develop a plan to reduce the use of pesticides across pesticides. the board. And I will say just just quickly is that in Quebec, for example, in Quebec, there's no spraying of forests anymore. In 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 Montreal, the mayor um, of of Montreal has literally. Um, you you can't spray anything. You can't use pesticides. You can't buy pesticides in Montreal. Well, if, if she can do it, if Valerie Leplant can do it in Montreal, why can't we all do that? So the the, the petition is sort of our tool towards, um, you know, getting the it, it's our Trojan horse. Let's just say that. So let I, I really hope that 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 we can, um, you know, thought it would be great to just for it to work. I mean, a petition, this is this petition is to the Minister of Health. It's a parliamentary petition. It's one of the basic tools available to us in the electoral uh, democracy in which we live. I don't think, I don't get the impression that the petition is the end goal, but it's it's a tool. And there, And as you can see from this panel, there are so many different constituencies that have a deep interest in this. And then all of us do, because it's already in our bodies. Um, that this it seems like this petition could be a kind of a beacon, uh, a rallying point. Um, so uh, into the weeds impact.com, it's pinned to the top of the Facebook Live, is a place where you can get right to signing the petition. Um, Rocky and Mary Lou, I want to hear from you again about uh, about the sort of campaigning moment that we're in, uh, in terms of the it seems like there's a few different things going on, a lot of different ways that folks can can plug in. Uh, does it feel like the tide is turning or is it like, is that, or, or is it just that more people are waking up um, to the to the extent of this issue? Either of you, and then the other can follow. The tide is Rocky. The time is now, get on board. <laughs> yeah, you feel a real sense of urgency. I, I think- Like what, I Rocky, think, Ro Ro sorry. Rocky, no, what, like, no go, go, go deeper, why? Why do you feel a sense of ur urgency like right now? <laughs> oh goodness i i just think that the pesticides are they've got to go they're a manifestation of of a prolonged denial of 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 relationship and um you know if we want healthy relationships and we want to connect to the land and to each other in a just and caring way uh we've got to get rid of a few things that aren't serving us well um yeah like you said abby we've got to shift from the killing paradigm to a caring paradigm. And um, that's maybe not the science you were hoping I would share, but there you go. Over, over to I you. I can't think of anything. I can't think of anything better. So we're, let, we're gonna shift from a killing paradigm to a caring paradigm. I think that speaks to just about every crisis that we face in society today. Uh, Mary Lou. I'm very hopeful um, because like we said, it is a perfect storm right now. Um, uh, Canadians are understanding now about desiccation and that it's not being sprayed on our holy forests. I mean, that's just dumbfounding. So that understanding is huge. The fact that, and I'm, I'm a lawyer, I believe in the law and the law is starting to cut the courts and that the politicians are falling, are starting to come around. So in Canada, there's our case, but in the U.S., there's very exciting stuff going on. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals just slammed EPA, their PMRA, so it's the Environmental Protection Agency, on their risk assessment of glyphosate and said, you guys uh, made up these bogus excuses that aren't valid in science. Redo it by October 1st. Um, and and uh, wait to see if it happens by October 1st. But EPA and PMRA worked together. They had a joint work plan. They used the same science, the same rodent studies that were described in the movie. Uh, we had fewer. And all PMRA did was just um, look at what EPA did and what JMPR did and said, yeah, it looks good. Um, so the transparency aspect of this and court proceedings and the transformation agenda of being able to see those studies getting confidential test data out there. I'm very hopeful that the tools are in the system to make it work if we just press on the right buttons. Lean on the levers. Um, I, I wanna bring in a question from the, from the audience. Um, we're coming up to the hour. We've made a little backroom agreement among the panelists that we're gonna go another 15 uh, minutes or so. And uh, if anyone has to leave, With we us. understand people have, people have lies, but this is, this is good. This feels really urgent. Um, so we got a question for Brett from Marcy Lipman in the chat. So you hear it's the bottom line. They spray those so they can produce more volume. 
how can you convince them otherwise? And this is clearly a question to you in the farming community, because you're surrounded, as you said, by farms that are using the traditional herbicides and pesticides and the industrial inputs in farming. So it's just the bottom line, man. What are you going to do? What, how do you convince people otherwise? Well, thanks, Marcy, for the question. Um, I know Marcy from a few other engagements in the past, so it's good to see that you're on the call tonight. I think the biggest way to do so is just leading by example and showing that there are alternatives. Uh, we ourselves have found that when you can collaborate with other farmers who aren't using glyphosate, you can find some really great ways to actually increase your productivity and decrease your costs. So we've seen our bottom line strengthen in the process because less of our dollars are going to line the pockets of Bayer and more than we're staying on the farm to enrich the ecology of our soil. One great example is, you know, you mentioned in the documentary, Jennifer, that I think soybean was the number one crop that glyphosate was used on for food production. And so we manage soybean in a very different way. Uh, we're actually growing cereal rye as an overwintering cover crop keeping the soil covered over the winter, reducing erosion. It grows up to be very tall in the springtime. We harvest that for a forage crop and cereal rye actually exudes an allelopathic compound that researchers at the University of Guelph have found has a natural herbicidal compound to reduce the germination of broadleaf weeds. And so we can harvest that rye. We have excellent forage there. So it's actually an extra crop in the system. And then we can seed soybean right into that stubble and the act of um, natural weed suppression from the rise of liliopathy in addition to its crop competition, that is a great way to actually increase our soybean yields. Uh, so you don't need it. I mean, if we just kind of change the way we think, um, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, one of the original pioneers of herbicides in Germany, I'm going to butcher his name, it was Bernard Vodem, I believe, in the um, 1900s said that cultural practices should form the foundation of all weed control and every other tool should be used as auxiliary only. And so if the pioneers that were leading the research into herbicides in the beginning of, of this industry were saying that, yeah, it's a tool, but we need to focus on a biological approach. You know, we've strayed so far from that concept. The good news is we know we have tools to get back there again. Brett, talk about the protein content in your soybeans. Excellent question, Jennifer. So, you know, talk about <laughs> yield, yield, right? We went to a Bayer-led meeting a few weeks ago, and the industry standard for soybean breeding was always 36% crude protein. We toured the plots, the, the people that are bragging about these soybean yields, they have intentionally bred the protein level down. So now we're talking about 25 to 28 percent crude protein soybean. So they're saying, oh, we're getting 60 bushels an acre, but how much of that is actually the protein, the nutrient density we want to see in the food? Our non-GMO soybean, like a lot of other folks in the area that can grow non-GMO soybeans that aren't bred for super high yield, they're at 42 to 46 percent crude protein versus mid 20s. So we're at a real decision point here, folks. What direction do we want to go in? Sure, it's maybe more raw bushels, but you need substantially more yield. You need 25 to 50 percent more yield to harvest the same crude protein per acre. So they're misleading people, and what they're doing is creating hollow food, and uh, they don't seem to care very much. But it definitely will affect the health of our population. Amazing. I just I'm still stuck on how passionate Brett got about seeding stubble. I just <laughs> really that'll just that'll stay with me for a while. Jennifer, do you mind if I play the other clip? Oh yeah, so to set that up a little bit, this this is the yeah. you know, as a filmmaker, I just want to say that but when my filmmaking ethics, the ethics of engagement are the most important thing that I do as a filmmaker, and it's an arrogant act to point a camera in somebody's face, and the that's why in order in order to really do my job, it requires incredible. Um, it, it requires humility and it requires a real trust and collaboration with the subject. And Lee Johnson is an extraordinary human being and he trusted us with his story. And some of the things that you'll see in the film are difficult things, but he wanted us to show them. He wanted us to show just how difficult it was for him to get up in the morning. And this will give you a, um, a little bit of, a, 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 of an introduction to him. 
Let's roll the clip. This is one of the beasts that I'm thinking about using in a session in LA. I like this one because it had a roster feel, so that's more international. It's not just hip hop. You know, I'm a cat from a small town, you know what I mean? We know how to carry ourselves to where you don't stick out. You know, you want to lay as low as you can, but I have to come out to a certain extent and say what I know and say my story so people can see what I've been through. Hello? I'm at the door. Oh, all right, all right, I'm coming. Mrs. Harvey here. Good to see you, Mom. I don't talk about it very much. And, uh... I look at Lee some of the time and I just get angry. Because... Have you ever seen a picture of him before he got that cancer? Well, there he is up there on the wall. See up there with his brother? That's him with the blue shirt on. And that's him over there with our Sally. He was living here when he got that job. And they had two kids, and there was a sofa bed here at one time. It lit out from a couch into a bed. Yeah, the boys used to sleep on the couch. You would sleep on the floor <laughs> where you can lay down. So we just laid down and we got a rest and Eric only got up and went to work to two jobs and I did whatever I could when I could. You know, we had the two boys and it was tough. It was tight in here. Um, we got through it though. He'd been unemployed for so long. Yeah. And when he got that job, he was just ecstatic. Yeah, that job saved me from the bottom. They know that I'm sick from this stuff, but I don't have any power. This is about food, this is about seed, this is about health, this is about the soil, this is about environment. This is not an Lee Johnson story. This is bigger than me. That's another clip from uh, the stirring new documentary, Into the Weeds, um, directed by Jennifer Bashwell. And that uh, Lee Johnson story is such a powerful one. Uh, one of my favorite moments in the movie that, you know, I think Lee Johnson and, and his courage and what he started in this landmark uh, legal litigation in the United States uh, is one of the reasons why we're here and having this conversation tonight. Um, and so getting a glimpse of an individual, a single person who uh, in so many ways represents uh, you know, a huge issue in our society, in our food system, in our natural systems, uh, and 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 in this in the legal systems in which we uh, live and work. It's really powerful to think of like a working class person who stands up and takes it all on themselves to move this forward. Um, and I just, yeah, just really grateful for this conversation and and Jen for the for for the film. And I want to take us towards the end of this conversation. We, the, the panel is about a future without glyphosate. Is it possible? 
and I think from Brett's experience on the farm, uh, uh, from the from the from the food system and the interconnected system that Sue uh, is reminding us has been here long before Europeans came to Turtle Island. Um, in the healthy future that Mary Lou's fighting for and that Rocky uh, uh, feels is so is so close, you know, is so tangible. Um, and in Gabriel and the dignity of the human beings who make our food um, and who do the, the hard work upon which all of our health rests, I, I, I feel really hopeful about the moment that we're in. Um, but what I found in my own activism, especially around the, the climate emergency, is that people need a vision of what we're fighting for. You know, there's no activism where we try to stop bad stuff from happening in the petition to ban glyphosate, to, to have a, a system that uses a lot less pesticide is a big no struggle. It's to stop bad stuff. But the yes struggles of what, what, what we're fighting for, the kind of world that we want to live in, it's really important to ground people in activism in that, in that positive vision. So I want to do a final go around where I challenge all of you to take me to the future that you're fighting for, to describe a world, let's say it's five years from now, let's say it's three years from now. It's not that different from the world that we live in right now, but it's a world where we no longer use glyphosate and, and, and the tremendous industrial pesticides and herbicides in the production of our food, in the management of, of our forests. And I wanna ask you, what does that future look like? Um, and uh, Jen, I'm actually going to put you on the spot first. Uh, yeah, no, no, I know, I know. Yeah. You thought maybe I'd like save you for last, yeah, but I know that I you've been immersed in the up. you've been you've been immersed in the litigation and in all the details of like what is wrong with our current system. But what does it look like for you as a like what is the human experience of a future with a uh, without glyphosate? Dream, dream out loud for us. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try and I'm going to be try to be fast. There's there's two things that I want to say. And I was just thinking about this again. And you know, this study, um, Avi, that Erica Chenoweth did um, uh, about 3.5% is, is of the population is all that it takes for radical change. It's a minority and nonviolent change, by the way. And her 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 study is fascinating uh, in terms of you know just going through violent and nonviolent um, uh, attempts at revolution and or, or or change and then tracking those over many years in different cultures and seeing that really three point five percent is kind of the number that is required. That's of not like engaged people of like engaged people, people who, are, who are fighting for change. And and I would say that you know uh, that's not a hard number to get to. Number one. Number two, when we were making this, of course, it was COVID again, and, and we were in the middle of shooting, and then we had to do all of this sort of complicated remote shooting where I'm on FaceTime asking somebody in Switzerland a question um, with the Krefeld entomological people. And, and one of the stories that we really wanted to do that we couldn't was in this region in northern Italy called Mals, where Mm. Literally, they it, it was a, a, a an agricultural community, very traditional, and the big big ag came in with apple farming, and they took over a lot of the land and started to um, uh, grow apples. And apples are sprayed enormously. And what was happening with this? The pest glyphosate was being sprayed, pesticides were being sprayed, and it was drifting onto these different regions. Far, you know, the the herb farm, the organic herb farm, adjacent to 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 the apple farms. And the women of the town um, decided that they were going to fight against it. And they made slogans on bed sheets that they hung out of their windows. And the whole community came together and said, you know what, we're not going to use it. We're, we're banning it. And then they were told by the EU, you're not allowed to do that. That's our job. We, we, you can't ban it when we say that it's OK. And they said, you know what? screw you, we're going to ban it anyway. We're gonna collectively say that we are not going to use it. And that region now has agriculture. It has enough food for everybody. It has enough space for everybody. It's still profitable. There's a, there's an economic basis. It's not like we're all you know going to start wearing sackcloth and you know have little gardens and and and, and that, that I know that's unrealistic, but they did it. And to me, that that utopia, is what we all can have. Sweet, we're all moving to this small place in Italy now. Awesome, <laughs> and you know the food they're growing is amazing. Um, 
Mary Lou, I want to go to you next because I want to know what a regulatory future looks like without without glyphosate. Well, I'd like a, a future without harmful pesticides um, because glyphosate, don't don't kid yourself, they're just waiting to bring something else in to, to with some other right. surfactants. So I think we need to look at the whole picture, reduce overall pesticide use. But uh, uh, the future would look like um, let's have regulators that actually implement the law the way it's written and follow the primary purpose, which is to connect to protect Canadians and the environment from the harms of pesticide, not have your annual report say, oh, our number one priority is trade. No, Canadians expect our regulators to protect us. And um, the law says that. So the future would look to me like regulators that actually implement that or politicians that are brave enough to make the regulators do that. And also Courage my is husband a huge part of this equation. bread without it hurting. <laughs> right, that's, that's real, that's good. Brett, from a from what does our farming sector look like? What is the what do the farms around you look like when we move uh, past glyphosate? You know, I think that what is your really world, what is your what is your what is your world look like? What is what is your world look like? Well, I think it's it's a diverse and vibrant rural landscape, and we're seeing tremendous consolidation across the rural landscape. And one of the things really concerned us was independent seed companies were being bought by the larger industrial chemical companies, and they've now been bought by the pharmaceutical companies. And so we're, we're at this massive time of how do we want to live? How do we want to connect with the earth? How do we want to feed ourselves? And I think that there's a real choice to be made right now. We hear across all different types of media, this, this tremendous cost in our healthcare system of cancers and, and the environmental stress we're under right now. And I think we can take steps towards remedying it if we look to what a biological agricultural approach can be. It doesn't have to be, you know, everyone being subsistence farmers. We have tools and techniques that we can farm at scale uh, while respecting the sanctity of, of mother nature. And uh, I think to look towards nature for the answers, it's a pretty exciting time. So putting the power back in the hands of the people and, and away from the hands of, of these large multinationals, that's what the future looks like to me. I am enjoying the revolutionary bent of this conversation. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, speaking of which, Gabriel. Oh, I made, maybe Gabriel is frozen. So I'll save. I'll save Gabriel until we get um, until we get a better connection back. Um, and Sue, I want to go to you um, to describe for us what 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 your land looks like if we can get off the industrial pesticide. Uh, roller coaster. Well, I see I see healthy lands and healthy peoples um, living in balance and living on what we need, not what we want, not what we that whole capitalism that drives it. But also, to um, I wanted to mention there is um, a campaign that's happening that the TK elders have initiated. It's called the White Ribbon Campaign, and the idea is to tie white ribbons around trees. And then to begin to have these conversations, your neighbors will see the white ribbons, people will see the white ribbons, and they'll say, what is that? This is glyphosate. This is what we're trying to stop happening because um, they're attacking they're attacking the trees, they're attacking our foods. And so I wanted to mention that, but what I see in the future is the government and the regulators and the non-Indigenous communities standing with our knowledge standing with us as a people with our traditional knowledge when we say that these things are poisoning us they're poisoning the land then they will stand non-indigenous peoples standing with us and supporting us with those um not necessarily integrated into these types of decision making but being a part of the decision making something similar to how the two o wampum belt was initially meant that there's two different canoes with our own governance systems traveling alongside one another and that would intersect and bring our minds and our sciences together when we need to, which I see right now is a big need that we bring these types of knowledges together to help to help with this issue of glyphosate. So it's a future in which we finally catch up a bit yep. more. And share you coming around to me what she said. <laughs> Thank you, Rocky. We are um, 
Oh, I think we got Gabriel back. Well, this is perfect timing. Gabriel, yes. I'm not going to I'm not going to repeat the question, but you're going to take me to the future. Yes. Describe Actually, it to I want me. Thank you. I want actually I want to go backwards. When I say backwards, back to the back to the old days. And what's the back back to the old days? That the food we eat, the wholesome food that we ate, that was our medicine. But in Canada, when I when I go to to the the different customers, home, I see a lot of medicine is part of the meal. That's not what I want. I want to see a future where our food will be wholesome. And for that to happen in the greenhouses where monoculture monoculture has been practiced, and you know if monoculture is easy for for pests and disease to come in and to spread rapidly. I want to see biodiversity. I want to see a diversified um, greenhouse rather than monoculture. I want to, that's one. Number two, I want to see smaller scale, more smaller scale production than those corporations, corporate grid. That's what I don't want to see. I want to see IPM, integrated pest management and not, not um, uh, uh, um, conventional, you know, that's dependent on synthetic um, pesticides. That's not what I want. That's the kind of future I want to see. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you all so much uh, for just a tremendously inspiring uh, conversation. And uh, I want to, can we throw up the slide and thank some of our event and impact partners? Um, because as, as Jennifer mentioned earlier, uh, you know, documentaries generally try to have an impact these days. Um, and the smart ones get together with really powerful groups that are already doing work in that space. Uh, and so environmental defense and Friends of the Earth Canada, Safe Food Matters, the David Suzuki Foundation, EcoJustice, uh, the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, and Prevents Cancer Now are all really important uh, groups that, have, that are supporting the impact uh, and engagement campaign of the film. And if you haven't already been there, please go to the Impact Campaign website, intotheweedsimpact.com. All the information you need is pinned as a post at the top of the Facebook Live. Um, so if you're still hanging out on Facebook, uh, which I know a bunch of you are, please go and check out the news and resources uh, section and the take action section on the website. You can sign the petition that was just launched last week, the petition that Jennifer and a whole bunch of other um, uh, really passionate people in, in, this, uh, in this cause have addressed to the Minister of Health. And I'll just repeat the demands uh, in the petition. We're asking for the, a ban of the sale and use of glyphosate to protect human health and the environment. We're asking the government to develop a comprehensive plan to reduce overall pesticide use in Canada, as Mary Lou put it. It's not all about one product. It really is about a worldview uh, uh, and moving from this culture of killing the undesirable and the unprofitable and caring uh, for the connections and the connective tissue among all living things. So get out there and support this petition, share it with your friends and your colleagues. We have until January 13th, 2023, but pretend the deadline is next week uh, and let's get as many signatures as possible. The beginning period is always the most important in a petition. So let's, let's, uh, let's, let's push it. Um, and uh, uh, Sue is just mentioning that the tech elders petition um, is we're also, I think we'll also try to find a way to circulate that one and the and the white ribbon campaign that Sue just told us about, um, we're sort of Jen? putting it together. Yeah, we're, we've already been talking to to Ray and Jan L about about you know sort of amalgamating in some way that petition. So we'll we'll talk more about that. Great. I also want to say, Avi, you're an awesome host, man. Like, I mean, I know you do this all the time, <laughs> but you're so great, and and you Thank you're you. you're really good, and you're you're such a you're a treasure um, and you're somebody who's always, always, always fighting for what's good. So thank you. It's all connected. Thank you. It was, a, it was a real honor to be with you all tonight. And thanks for everyone for hanging in on the Facebook Live. I know they're going to archive you. this conversation and I hope it's of use for folks later. Beautiful. Good night, everyone. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Thanks all. Good night. Now our images will wink.